hope you're all well. Thank you very much for joining us for the community of uh, Rabbi Shishla, Chabad Strathaven in Johannesburg, co-hosting it, and Rabbi Ash Darren, Chabad Tableview in Cape Town, for joining us and partnering with us this evening. Um, thank you very much for being over here. Tonight you're going to be well informed. Last year at the annual uh, Chabad Rabbinical Conference, the Kinnis as we call it, um, which was done um, on Zoom and with uh, digitally, uh, wasn't face to face at all, I heard a workshop of Deron's and he was absolutely fascinating and very well put over a great message. So uh, I thought it would be a very uh, appropriate in these difficult times that we're going through, especially with a spike in crem cremation, to have uh, uh, Daron address us. You must have said you, Daron Kornbluth is a best-selling author, internationally renowned speaker, and an internationally licensed tour guide in Israel. Daron is a best-selling author of a book called Why Be Jewish? Another raising kids to love being Jewish. And cremation or burial, which we're going to hear tonight, a Jewish view. And uh, this is by a mosaic press. Daron speaks in many countries and cities around the world to all different types of audiences and on various subjects. As I said, Daron is also an experienced and licensed Israeli tour guide, and he offers tours of all types of families to shuls and uh, all over Israel for groups and so forth. But tonight's subject is a very um, serious subject that needs to be uh, adhered to. We need to put planning into it. We need to think about it, especially in today's times. And uh, we could ask Daron to please unmute yourself and address us on cremation versus burial, the Jewish perspective. Thank you very much, Daron. Thank you very much, Rabbi. Uh, hi, everyone. It's so nice to be with you. Um, the first thing I wanted to just do is to just check that you can hear me. So can I have a thumbs up? Just give me a thumbs up from wherever you are all over South Africa. I wanna see lots of thumbs. Okay, looking good. So that means that it's working. Uh, there's a lot of people, just names, I assume you've been here. It'd be nice to see you, but that's okay. Um, so it's nice to, uh, nice to meet you, so to speak. My name is Daron Kornbluth, and I'm speaking to you from uh, Ramat Beit Shemesh, where I live in the Holy Land. Um, I have had the pleasure of uh, being in South Africa a number of times, and uh, right now we'll have to do it vir you know, virtually, as you said, uh, Rabbi Shlomo, uh, well chosen. So um, thank you. Thank you for hosting. It's, uh, I want to tell you a story. The, uh, I'm into stories. So there's a story about this, uh, this fellow who um, is, uh, you know, sick in bed. He's an older person. He's laying there in his bed and he calls over his wife. He says, honey, come and sit beside me on the bed. Kind of a strange request. So she comes, she sits beside him on the bed. And uh, when she sits beside him, he says, honey, there's a uh, thing I want to talk to you about. Do you remember when uh, we were in our 20s and I broke my leg and you were there? Yes, honey, I was. And do you remember when uh, we were in our 40s? And I, um, you know, I went bankrupt and you were there. Yes, honey, I was. Um, and do you remember when, uh, you know, I was in my 50s and I had my heart attack and you were there. Yes, honey, I was. So he says, well, I have something to tell you. And a tear rolls down her cheek and she leans over and he says, honey, your bad luck. <laughs> so, there are some subjects 
that uh, they just seem like they're bad luck. People don't want to talk about them. People don't want to hear about them. It's the last thing you want to go to a lecture about, the last thing you want. And death, burial, cremation, certainly one of those subjects. There is no doubt that this is something that makes us uncomfortable. A, uh, a comedian once said, I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I want to achieve it through not dying. <laughs> and you know, like thinking about this stuff, going there. And by the way, um, you know, it, it's not so simple that you do talk about it so much. I'll just give you an example. Um, the, um, the ancient Tibetans, the ancient Egyptians, um, from what we know, and you know, archaeology is mostly guesswork, uh, but, um, but from what we know, their societies were very death focused. The pharaoh, the pharaoh buried with him in the pyramids, boats and foodstuffs. It was, you know, it was all about the afterworld as far as we know. They talked a lot about it. They wrote about it. Some societies were, some societies weren't. Modern society today, the West, very much the opposite for most people, right? We don't want to talk about it. We want to hear about it. Let's not deal with it. You know, people want to get it over and done with. By the way, even Judaism is not that into talking about death. What do Jews say when we have a drink? L'chaim, right? Don't worry, rabbis, it's just water. It's the alcohol is later, after the talk, okay. Um, so when we say l'chaim, we're into life. Anybody remember that uh, terrible day when uh, Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin of Israel was assassinated, 1995, November, and the president of the United States at the time, Bill Clinton, gave a beautiful eulogy for a slain prime minister, Yitzhak Rabin. And the last two words of the eulogy became a bumper sticker in Israel, Shalom Chaver, goodbye, my friend, right? That became famous. But in that eulogy, President Clinton said something fascinating. He said that the Jews are a positive people. And even the Jewish prayer for the dead doesn't mention death. Now, there isn't really no Jewish prayer for the dead. What was he thinking of? The Kaddish prayer. And you know what? He was right. Yiskadal the Yiskadash Shemei Rabbah. May his name be elevated. We talk about God's presence, God's name, the sanctification. We don't, we don't even mention death too much. And throughout most of history, you didn't really have to. Because what's life about? God will take care of what happens after. I'm here to make the world a better place, contribute to my community, make the world a dwelling place for God. All the good things that we're here to do, improve ourselves, help others, God will take care of what happens later. So that's okay. For most of history, you didn't have to talk about this stuff so much. Until recently. Now, something dramatic has happened. It is happening at different speeds in different places. I don't know the statistics for South Africa, but I do know that all over the world, cremation rates are going up dramatically. I grew up in Canada. And just to talk about North America, Canada, the United States. When I was a kid, not that long ago, <laughs> I'm, I just passed my 50th. When I was a kid, cremation rates were low single digits, depending on where, depending on what. It was 3%. I'm talking about the general population, not Jews, just everybody, Canadian, America, talk about US for a simple, you know, well known statistics. At 4%, 5%. As of now, 55% of the American dead are being cremated. It's quickly approaching six out of 10. I mean, Americans, 340 million Americans, roughly 3 million die a year. Last year was extra, unfortunately, because of COVID, right? The majority of Americans are being cremated. In certain parts, it's much, much higher. Obviously in the Far East, it's always been high. In Europe, it's the majority. I don't know in South Africa, but I do know that everywhere around the world, cremation rates are going up 
dramatically. And of course, Jews are following suit. So my question for you, you tell me, what are the reasons that around the world, anyone, Christian, Muslim, whatever it is, people are choosing cremation. The thing that I love about Zoom, I used to travel pre-corona, I used to travel around the world. And uh, obviously it's nice to meet people in person. But what I love about Zoom is that it's actually incredibly interactive. So please use the chat function on my screen. It's the bottom of my screen. Chat to everyone and you tell me, forget about Jews for a minute. Why are, let's talk about people in the West. Why are people in South Africa and Europe and North America, why are people today choosing cremation? What are reasons that you have heard, that you have read, you've thought about yourselves? This may be something you've chosen for yourself. We're here to share information, right? So what are the reasons? Why are people today of all types and all ages, why are they choosing cremation more than ever before? What are the reasons you have heard? So, Oh, I'm getting some very good answers. Thank you very much, South Africa. We see that. I don't know if I'm pronouncing people's names right. So Lara says it's cheaper. Yes, we hear that a lot. Um, Rabbi, environmentally friendly, right? That's what people talk about a lot. Oh, um, joy, the family of the deceased are not living in the same place. Mobility issues, absolutely. Uh, land is scarce. This is great, Ezra, thank you. Uh, costs, very good. Cheaper, less messy. Very interesting. I like how you put that. Um, cost, USA, definitely. Land is limited. Convenience, environmental. Uh, okay, well, no, Gary, we'll get into the, uh, you know, we'll analyze these in a minute. But these are the reasons what you've said here is excellent, everybody. If you have any more, please keep typing. You have already hit the main ones. By the way, I have spoken to people about burial and cremation uh, my book on the subject, uh, just, uh, you know, since you mentioned it before, Rabbi Shlomo, you know, it's called Burial, Cremation or Burial, A Jewish View, Mosaic of Press. This came out in 2012, okay? That's, that's almost nine years ago. Um, so the, the um, I've been speaking about the subject uh, ever since, and um, tens of thousands of people, and in every crowd that I speak to, I ask this question, whether it was in person before Corona, uh, traveling around or now uh, in Zoom. And um, okay, we're just uh, yeah, it's in a person's will. Thank you very much, Sandy. If somebody, if somebody chose it, you don't want to go against them. Okay, great. Okay, let's hold off for now. We'll get back to more questions later. Um, so the reasons that people give for choosing cremation are consistent. Um, the same answers that you gave, you gave them very quickly, I'm impressed, are the same answers that I hear in the United States and Canada and Europe. I talk to people in Venezuela, at, at Hong Kong, it's all the same, which means that this is, these are the reasons why people are choosing cremation. Now, what we're gonna do now is uh, we are going to divide our time. We have a short amount of time together and I wanna use it well. I wanna first analyze the reasons that you cited why people today are choosing cremation. We're gonna see that some of them are more valid than others. I'm a very you know, direct person. There are some of those reasons that actually make more sense than others. Some are not true and some are, well, you'll, you'll hear it. We're gonna analyze them. That, so we're gonna analyze why people today are choosing cremation. And then we're gonna flip the script and we're going to the second part where we're gonna say, okay, so why have Jews always focused on burial? And then we're gonna have time for a little bit of talk about the soul and uh, then uh, questions and comments. Okay, that's how it's going to go. We're going to do analyze the reasons that people choo are choosing cremation. We're going to then get into why Jews are focused on burial, and then we'll get into questions and comments. Okay, um, first thing somebody mentioned uh, money. Let's leave that for now. Uh, we'll get back there. Don't worry. Uh, environmental reasons. Several of you mentioned environmental reasons. Uh, there are two types of environmental critiques of burial, uh, and they're serious. Number one is the amount of land that is used. And number two is what is put into the land. You see, they're two separate things, right? They're connected, but they're separate. One is just the amount of land, wasting land. And one is not about the amount of land, it's just about what you're putting into the land. So the first one is based on a very simple moral argument. The argument is we are a growing population we have a limited amount of land. 
slowly but surely we're running out of land. So why would you waste land on dead bodies that don't need it? Leave it for the birds and the trees and the kids and the parks and the forest. It's a moral argument, right? Because we all know that if you really had to choose between land for dead bodies and land for the living, right? What does Judaism focus on? Well, Chaim, <laughs> life. So the only problem is I ran the numbers. I did the math. I'm not the first person, but since I've done this, since my book came out in 2012 and since my talks, I have never once been challenged on these numbers. Okay, get this. I'm not gonna use a lot of statistics for you. Uh, it's boring. I'll give you resources later that you can uh, look things up if you want. I, I'm gonna use an American statistic. I don't have a South African one, I'm sorry. I'm gonna use an American statistic. Okay, when well-documented. Get this. The United States of America is 340 million people. Forget about Jews. I'm talking about the general population, right? If every American who died were to be buried, it would take 10,000 years to use up 1% of America's landmass. Everybody get that stat? If every American who died were to be buried, it would take 10,000 years to use up 1% of America's landmass. And we all know that few, if any, cemeteries would last 10,000 years. The point is, there is no problem of land. Serious environmentalists do not even mention land as an issue because it isn't one. This is true in North America. This is true in South America. This is true in Europe. This is true in Africa. This is true in Asia. This is true in Australia. There's only three places to my knowledge that this isn't true. Japan, Hong Kong, and Singapore. By the way, there are solutions in all those areas. The point is, if you want to get buried in downtown Johannesburg, you have a problem. Land is scarce. But within a 60 minute drive of every metropolitan area, everywhere, there's a ton of land. Burial uses up a very small amount of land. We use more land for new big retail stores every year than we do for burial plots. Serious environmentalists don't even talk about this. It's not an issue. By the way, if you doubt me, when this corona thing ends and we're allowed to fly again, look down. Have you ever, just look, there's a, there's a ton of land, no problem. So that's not a serious environmental issue. The real environmental issue is not the amount of land, there's plenty. The real environmental issue is what goes into the land. Two huge problems, essentially pollution. Metal caskets, you have to make them, forge the metal, shape it, paint it, everything, goes into the ground, lasts for hundreds or a thousand years, rusting, it's terrible for planet Earth. Second, embalming. I don't know if it's common in South Africa. In the United States, it's extremely common. The idea is they want the body to look better for a viewing, right? And they want the body to last a little longer. It's still gonna decompose, but instead of taking a few months or whatever, it's gonna take two years, three years, so they postpone it. Um, so what they do, what embalming basically is, is the removal of the liquids, basically the blood, and the replacement with preservatives. Formaldehyde is still the number one choice in Europe and America. Very toxic. So environmentalists hate these two things, metal caskets and embalming. Anybody notice anything these two problems have in common? I see the rabbi smiling. They're not Jewish, ladies and gentlemen. We don't do either. Judaism insists, requests, recommends a simple wood casket, right? Can be a pine box. Here in Israel, by the way, the body is carried in a wood casket, but when it's actually put into the ground, it's just a burial shroud, the talit or whatever they use. Um, the, the casket is reused, believe it or not. You don't even have to have a casket. In most places, the, the tradition is to use a casket 
or the municipal requirements involve casket. Simple wood casket, biodegradable, goes, no problem. Uh, in terms of embalming, Judaism considers it a grave offense to the dignity of the human being to start desecrating the body like that, taking out the blood, putting in, we don't do that. So Jewish burials have always been considered and are a model of environmentalism. No issue whatsoever. By the way, cremation on the other hand has serious environmental problems. After the talk, you can Google and find that about uh, three, four months ago, the city of Los Angeles had to change its air pollution rules because COVID has led to unfortunately extra deaths in California, the crematorium were being overloaded and there was too much pollution from the crematoria oven going into the air, breaking pollution rules. You're burning bodies. It's bad for the environment. For people my age or older, if you have a, uh, a, a filling in your teeth, if you had a cavity, you probably have mercury. You probably have mercury in your teeth. Terrible for the environment. There's many municipalities that do not allow a crematorium to be placed beside a school. Ask yourself why. Environmentalists are not in favor of cremation. Cremation uses a tremendous amount of fossil fuels. We're all trying to switch to electric cars. Suddenly you're using all this gas to burn up bodies. Right? And it releases chemicals into the air. Environmentalists are in favor of what is called green burial. Green burial means no metal caskets, no embalming, plan the cemetery in an environmentally friendly way. By the way, we're pretty good at that. Everyone is different. But the main two things we have, Jewish burials are great environmentally. Next, few of you mentioned, uh, so I wanted to mention, I think it was, it was hinted to somewhere else, that um, families are not together as they used to be. Uh, in South Africa, I know you know this well, as many people have children or grandchildren who have left South Africa. I'm from Montreal, Canada originally, and because of politics and, uh, and all different uh, you know, internal squabbles, the, uh, much of the Jewish community has left, the English speaking community has left Montreal, um, but you find this everywhere now, and it's a real issue. People say, well, if nobody's going to visit my grave because they live far away or they're not that traditional or whatever, if no one's going to visit my grave, why bother having one? That's why, by the way, in the United States, the state of Florida has particularly high cremation rates because there are so many millions of retirees. They leave the colder climate of New York, New Jersey. They move down to Florida. And they say, I mean, where am I going to be buried? I haven't lived up in New York for 30 years, for 20 years. I don't know anybody here in Florida except my retirement village, and they're all going to die soon if they're not already dead. So who's going to, no one's going to visit the grave. So here I want to test your Jewish knowledge. Rabbis, you are not allowed to answer this question. Here's a test for your Jewish knowledge, okay? We are uh, going to check, okay? And if you tell me if this is, you know, uh, true or false, the number one visited site in Israel, the number one tourist site in Israel is the grave of Moses, the Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu. Thumbs up if it's true, it's the number one visited site. Thumbs down if it's false. I see a bunch of thumbs down. I see some people typing. Anybody saying it's true? Come on, two Jews, three opinions. We have to have like somebody being the outlier over here. Okay, so it's false. Now there's a couple ways you could know it's false. First of all, of course, the Western Wall is the most visited site. But aside from that, um, Moshe Rabbeinu, the Moses, is his burial site in Israel? End of the Bible, one of the most famous burials in the Bible. There's a lot of burials in the Bible. Abraham buries Sarah near the beginning. And Moses, the Moses, is buried towards the end of the Bible. 
he never makes it into the promised land, right? He's buried in what's now the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan. Right? He's on the east bank of the Jordan River. So that's why it's not the most visited site in Israel. It's not in Israel. But more importantly, we don't even know where it is. The verse makes it clear that God hid the place of his burial. Why? We understand that he was such a great prophet, people would start to think of him as some kind of a God. And it was better that, better that no one know where it is. So ask yourself a question. In the roughly 3,300 years since Moses died, has anyone ever visited his grave? Never. And yet, we know that 3,000 years ago, archaeologically, there was plenty of cremation. It was the norm. But God did not choose cremation. He buried Moses. Because these two things that in our modern minds we put together, visiting a grave and having a grave. And if no one's going to visit a grave, why bother having one? These two things are not connected. The great example of Moses just proved the point. No one has ever visited his grave, and yet he had one. Because with, visiting a grave is a beautiful thing. I don't know if you connect to it. I actually do. I like going to cemeteries. I like going to, don't worry, I don't go every day. I'm not a weirdo. But, um, but I do connect to it uh, in some way. And, um, but you don't have to. There's no obligation to go visit graves. That has nothing to do with whether or not the person and the body deserves and needs burial. As we're going to see, they do with or without visitation. Okay, a few more things that you mentioned, um, which was we mentioned environmental issues and we mentioned the um, people being uh, in different places. Um, we mentioned that uh, convenience. Um, and uh, what do you mention? And I, this is like a big one, actually. Um, I'll tell you how I got into this subject. I was never really into the subject of burial or cremation, uh, it always seemed kind of morbid to me. Like I, my, uh, I used to travel around speaking and I've written a bunch of books. It was mentioned by, uh, by the rabbi before, um, the, that I, um, you know, I speak about um, keeping our families Jewish. I speak about happiness, I speak about relationships, I speak about how to keep your grandkids Jewish, I speak about why be Jewish, I speak to teens. I speak, all, all, it's all like positive Jewish identity and stuff and relationship stuff. And like burial was never on the, uh, on the agenda. And I was on a speaking tour in Florida about 10 years ago. And I opened up a Jewish newspaper and I saw an ad from a Jewish funeral home offering Jewish cremations. And I'm a traditional Jewish boy from Montreal. I didn't know there was such a thing as Jewish cremation. <laughs> so I started getting into it and I spent three years researching. And I wanna share with you the single most surprising thing that I learned in my three years of research on cremation. And I read everything ever written on the subject. I think <laughs> I interviewed people, I got the plans to crematoria ovens. I mean, I went, I really did a lot. Single biggest surprise. Previous to my research, I had always assumed that a crematorium, a cremation was something like a microwave oven. You put the body in, you press the body, the, the button, and three minutes later, an urn pops out with ashes or something like that. Ladies and gentlemen, forgive me, you knew it was a talk on, uh, on burial and cremation, so it wasn't all gonna be so pleasant. Um, but just a short description. Um, a typical cremation today of a thin person, right? Takes 60 to 90 minutes. That's if you're thin. If, like me, the last year and a half of COVID did a number on you, you know, they say they call it the COVID-19 because we all put on 19 kilos or whatever it is. Uh, so if you're bigger than you were like me, then uh, it's two to three hours. If your body mass index, your BMI is 30 or above, it's three to four hours. During those hours of burning, forgive me, the body is not calm and placid and spiritual. No, 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 no the tendons, the muscles are contracting and expanding. The brain is sizzling. It is a smelly, loud, awful thing. Now, I'm not going to be here and actually claim that burial is pleasant. 
I remember high school lab class, okay? Decomposition is gross. I get it. They're both pretty gross. They're both pretty disgusting. But get this. Burial is the natural way of every living thing. Cremation is artificial. Just think about it. A plant grows, blossoms, goes back to Mother Earth. A, an animal is born, runs around the forest, lays down, goes back to Mother Earth. Burial is natural. Cremation is a human artificial attempt at control. It's fascinating. So it's not that fast. It's not a few minutes. Um, it is not that pleasant. So it's funny, as you go through the reasons that um, people choose cremation, I think we've gone through most or all of them, we can do more later if you want, but as you go through the reasons people choose cremation, there's nobody to visit, uh, there's uh, environmental reasons, whatever it's going to be, the reasons suddenly fall apart. They're not true, except one. There is one reason for cremation that is undeniable. What am I talking about, ladies and gentlemen? Money. At the end of the day, while there are exceptions, you can do a very expensive cremation and you can do a cheap burial. I don't know about in South Africa, but in uh, Canada and the States, the last year and a half, right? It's been graveside burials. You're not allowed to go into funeral homes. It's all faster, it's cheaper. It's, you could, but on the whole, cremations are much cheaper than burials. So the question now is, so true, the reasons that people are choosing cremation don't make any sense. It's not better for mobility. It's not good for the environment, all that kind of stuff. But why spend the extra money for burial? And now is where I want to flip into the second part of our talk. I'm going to move quickly because I want to make sure we have time for questions and comments. Um, why have Jews throughout the millennia focused on burial? There's going to be a number of reasons. I'll give you some resources later for those who want more. Let's start. In World War II, in, um, in the Kovno Ghetto, there was a rabbi named Ephraim Oshri. Rabbi Oshri survived the war, incredibly, and told the following story. Moved to New York after the war and told the following story. He said that one day he's uh, in his little room in the ghetto and a Nazi SS officer barges in, blonde hair, blue eyes, and the rabbi thinks he's about to be killed. And this Nazi SS officer starts speaking to him in perfect Yiddish. Rabbi, I'm a Jew. I have fake papers. I looked the part. This is how I'm surviving the war. But Rabbi, I'm a very sick man. I only have a few weeks to live. And I know what they're going to do to my body. They are going to bury my body in a Nazi cemetery surrounded by Nazis with a Nazi cross over me forever. Rabbi, I could do this just to fake getting by for a few months to survive, but to be buried as a Nazi with a Nazi cross over my body forever, I can't do. Can I be cremated to avoid that fate? And Rabbi Oshri gently said to this Sick Jewish man, my dear, dear child, no, you can't. In normal times, a Jew must do whatever they can to have proper Jewish burial. In normal times, that is a little bit of earth from the land of Israel and the Jewish headstone and the Jewish cemetery and the Hever Kedisha preparing the, um, preparing the body uh, and, uh, and the Kaddish being said, and in these crazy, terrible times, said Rabbi Oshri, the minimum is just to be buried. A Jew must do whatever they can to avoid cremation, to be buried, even if it means being buried in a Nazi cemetery. 
and he quoted verse after verse, Talmudic reference after Talmudic reference, Maimonides, the code of Jewish law. This is a big thing. You know, there are some parts of being Jewish that we sometimes think are big. You know, in America, it's the bagels and locks. I don't know if you have that in South Africa or it's the, the, the braai, I don't know if you do it like, you know, whatever, like everybody has their little cultural things, right? Um, this is not bagels and locks, ladies and gentlemen. When a new Jewish community is formed, do you know what its first three responsibilities are? What is it supposed to, the main, a new Jewish community moves to some town where there are no Jews. What are the three things the community is responsible to do? A Jewish school for the kids, a mikvah, a ritual bath, and Hevra Kadisha, burial society. Provide for proper burial for all Jews. It's that important. Anybody here see the news recently that a young man named Gilad Shalit just got married? Did you follow that in the news? I don't know if you recognize the name. Many of you will probably recognize the name. Gilad Shalit was the poor soldier that was kidnapped and kept in a Hamas dungeon in Gaza for five years. And a number of years ago, uh, we here in Israel made a, um, made a trade. Over a thousand terrorists, including people with blood on their hands, were traded to get him back. And we're all ecstatic for the family and happy for him. We should do whatever we can to get our captives. You know, it was a controversial decision here in Israel for obvious reasons, right? You're letting terrorists out. It's a pretty famous story. What you may not have heard is that several times in Israel's history, we have exchanged living terrorists to get back dead bodies, people who we knew were dead. That's how ingrained in the Jewish tradition and Jewish culture, even in Israel it is, to provide for burial. First reason that Jews have focused on burial for thousands of years. Roman historian Tacitus, when he described us to his compatriots 2000 years ago, in a very short description, one of the few things he said was, the Jews bury rather than burn the dead. It stood out. For 3,000 years, we have buried the dead because it's a core part of who we are as Jews. And it's filtered down straight even to the state of Israel. Number two, um, if you were to make a map of the world, of where people believe in God, one God, monotheism, versus where people believe in no God, atheism, or many gods, polytheism, a monotheism map, call it like that, and you were to make another map of burial, the two maps overlap incredibly. Just think about it. The Far East, India, Japan, belief in many gods, polytheism, cremation is the norm, over 90%. Right? Um, in Islamic countries, very strictly monotheistic, there's no such thing as cremation. Not one crematorium oven in an Islamic country it doesn't, doesn't happen. Obviously, they got it from us here in Israel, got it from, from, from Jews, right? In Israel, there's only, there's only one crematorium operating here in Israel, uh, and it basically started with the uh, Russian non-Jews, and it's a very small percentage. By the way, even in the United States, the, more, the Christian Bible Belt, like in the south and the center of the country, burial rates are much higher than secular coasts. It's fascinating that there is this link between monotheism and burial. A lot of literature as to why that is. I have a very simple explanation. The explanation is that at the very beginning of the Bible, which is the proof text of monotheism, right? The Torah. It says that every human being is created in the image of God. Selem Elohim. You don't mess with that image. God is not physical, obviously. He doesn't have, it's our image. In some way, we represent the divine in our actions, but even in our, our physical beings. And you don't burn it. You don't desecrate it. You lay it gently down to sleep. It's an amazing thing. Ladies and gents, think back to when you were a kid and your pet dog, Spot, died. Right? 
Do you remember what your parents said to you? I am convinced that your parents did not say, okay, honey, you bring over Spot's body. I'll fire up the barbecue. <laughs> they didn't say that. What did they say? Let's bury Spot, honey, because we bury things that are important to us. We bury treasure. We burn the garbage. Isn't it an amazing thing? Couple more ideas and then I wanna open it up for questions. The, um, so like this, I'm sure all or most of you have been to a Jewish funeral and you may have noticed the custom, the Jewish custom that's called, shouldn't have to with all I know, tearing Kriya. People know what I'm referring to, tearing Kriya, where the mourners, right, the close mourners, that's the, uh, God forbid, you know, the, the parents, the children, brother, sister, spouse, the mourners tear a piece, of, a piece of clothing, the outer garment, when someone dies. By the way, I don't know if it's hit South Africa, but in the States and Europe now, there's a lot of people that what they're doing is they're sort of giving the person a tie and cutting the tie for a gentleman or giving the, the mourner, if it's a woman, giving her a little ribbon and cutting the ribbon, right? It's a very nice sentiment, just between you and me. That's not actually the point of the tradition. The point of the tradition is not that somebody artificially gives me something that's not mine and you cut it. The point of the whole tradition is it's, it's, it's my clothing. I'm torn. And for the week of Shiva, the person is sitting there in this torn outer, outer clothing. So imagine the following. God forbid someone dies and Mother Earth, the planet, tears Korea. A tear is opened up in the earth, in the fabric of the earth, because it's not okay. We don't just go back to work tomorrow. It's not all good and fine. It hurts. It's supposed to hurt. There's a tear. We feel the pain because there is pain. And slowly, lovingly, family members, community members, lower the body into the earth. Lovingly cover it with dirt. Healing begins, but there is always a headstone. There is always a scar. The person is never forgotten. They have left their mark on the world. The earth itself tears Korea. What this points to, ladies and gentlemen, is that healthy societies need burial. It is unhealthy to just do away with it. I've noticed in the modern world, there's two somewhat contrary directions that people do with death. Some people, very uncomfortable with it. They want to get rid of it as fast as possible. I'm going to do cremation instead of burial, right? It takes a few hours instead of a couple of days, right? Instead of sitting Shiva for seven days, we'll do three days, one day, right? Just get the whole thing over with, right? Don't have to make a visit on a Shiva call, I'll send a car, whatever, just get it over with. There's other people that do the exact opposite. Instead of a wood casket, I'll use a metal casket, slow it down. The decomposition will take two years instead of one year. Embalm, right? So the body will stay in its form for an extra few months, an extra year. Do an above ground mausoleum. So it doesn't, it still decompose. But the second person is trying to slow down the process. So at first glance, these two attitudes are opposite. Speed up the process, slow down the process. But when you think about it, they both agree. Both attitudes are, I don't like what's happening. I'm unwilling to accept what's happening. And I'm going to try and change what's happening. Speed it up, slow it down. The Jewish view is, listen, six days a week, you improve the world. You give, you change the world. One day a week, Shabbat, we remember, you know what? Ultimately, I'm not in control. Your whole life, you build, you improve the world, you give. But then at the very end, I sit back and I say, 
I'm not going to try and speed things up. I'm not going to try and slow things down. I'm not going to try and shoot the remains into space or make a coral reef. Or, I'm not going to do anything weird. I'm going to accept God's decree, the ultimate in humility, which is how we're supposed to end our time here on earth. Ladies and gents, I want to share one more core idea, and then we'll wrap it up and have questions and comments. It's interesting, and I think the rabbis have been surprised, I'm just guessing, that um, I actually have not talked about in my, our whole 45 minutes together, whatever it's been, the soul, which is incredible when you think about it, because obviously in our sources, the main subject of burial and cremation is the soul, the neshama. So um, let's spend a few minutes talking about what's uh, not easy to understand, but it's easy to gain a bit of an understanding. And I would say it like this. Okay, imagine a woman, God forbid, loses her husband. They've been married for 50 years. She comes back from the cemetery, takes off her black dress, puts on her red party dress, high heels, does some makeup, and goes straight out to the bar looking for another guy that very night. Is that normal? Of course not, right? When you have a partner, when you're with somebody for 50, 60, 70 years, you don't just move on, right? It's not just over and you move on. So our tradition says, that the body and the soul are partners. And when the body ceases functioning, its soul does not just move on because the body and the soul are a unit like a husband and a wife. I'll explain this in the following way. Ladies and gentlemen, raise your hand if you have ever visited a Jewish monastery or convent. Anyone ever visited a Jewish monastery or convent? Trick question, guys. There aren't any. Ever wonder why? Catholics have monasteries and convents. Eastern religions have monasteries and convents. Why don't we? Well, the answer is we don't believe in them. Just think about it. If you were to ask a Catholic, who's the holiest person on the planet? They'd probably say the Pope, right? The Pope is celibate, right? Eastern mystics, right? They abstain from you know, sexuality. They sleep on a hard floor, right? Eat very simple food. Why do they do that? I mean, two different religions, but the same, on this point, it's fascinating. They actually are the same. Their philosophy is, and not what you think Catholics are stupid, not stupid people. It's a philosophy. Philosophy I happen to disagree with, but it's a philosophy. And get this, their philosophy is, if you want to be spiritual, you want to raise up and you have to deny the physical because it's one or the other. And that's why there's priests and there's nuns and the mystics on a mountaintop because it's, it's a fight. Soul versus body is a fight. It's one or the other, zero sum game. The Jewish attitude, the Torah philosophy is completely different. On Shabbat, we have great food. It's a mitzvah for a husband and wife to be together. God is a good God that created a good planet. Physicality is good. The soul and the body are partners. Now you can't get carried away and leave a hedonistic life, but the soul and the body are not enemies. They're partners. And that soul stays with its body. When the body is buried, Kabbalistic, our mystical sources explain, the soul goes back and forth for seven days between its body and the Shiva house to hear what is being said about it. Slowly but surely, the soul goes up to heaven, but a part of it always stays connected here below. It's an amazing thing. What the soul wants, what the soul needs, what the soul is begging for is a proper burial to help it pass on to the next stage of existence. Death is not the end. Death is a doorway, is a doorway. We don't understand what's on the other side of the door, but there is something on the other side of the door. And burial is what helps 
move it along. Now, this is not a guilt trip. If you chose cremation for a loved one, if you, Judaism is not into guilt, okay? I know that's a surprise to people, Jewish guilt, but it's really not, right? Um, you know, what do we focus on? L'chaim, to life. So whatever decisions were made, give a donation for the local Chabad and the person's memory. They didn't ask me to say that, but they deserve it. And move on, right? We're focusing on the future, right? The soul, who the person is, wants the body to be buried, needs the body to be buried. Ladies and gentlemen, we're almost done. We started out talking about the realization that today, cremation rates are going up all over the world. And the reasons why people are choosing cremation are pretty standard. They're almost all mistakes. People think there isn't enough land. There's plenty of land. It's not an issue. Why do you have to be buried downtown? How often do you actually visit a cemetery? You can't drive for half an hour, an hour. It's not an issue. Um, the next is the, what is put into the land, meaning pollution. Metal, metal caskets, embalming, terrible. Mobility issues, right? We talked about the fact that you know, Moses never had a visitor his grave. We don't know where it is. So when you get into the reasons that people are choosing cremation, they're just not true except one. Cremation is generally cheaper. So why is it worth the extra money? That's what I've tried to lay out for you. A few headlines that we've shared. Number one, the Ephraim Oshri story, the idea that this is a core part of who we are as Jews. This is not some cultural thing of having bagels and lox. This is, this is core, this is key, this is all over the Torah. Abraham is buried and Sarah is buried and Rachel is buried. It's unbelievable. Number two, this idea that God chose burial for Moses. Even without mobility issues, God chose burial. We're trying to be like God. The idea that monotheists connect to burial, that we sense somehow that the human being, the human body is in the image of God, you don't mess with that. We bury treasure, we burn the garbage. Right? We talk about the idea that the earth, the tear in the earth, Kriya, the earth is tearing Kriya. We're not supposed to go back to work the next day and present, uh, pretend as if nothing happened. There's pain here, but the person has never forgotten. They leave their mark with the gravestone. And we talked about the idea of the sword which is the deepest idea. We only touched on it a little bit. We can talk about it more if you'd like. The idea, the soul and the body are partners. And there's nothing that the soul wants more than to have its body buried to help it make that transition to the next world, whatever that is. One more idea, and then I wanted to open it up for questions. So um, I don't know where I got this from, but uh, I have this monologue in my, in my head of an older Jewish fellow that he calls together his kids and he says, kids, there's something serious I wanna tell you. I may not have been the best Jew on the planet. I didn't really have much of an education. There's some things I did, some things I didn't do. Looking back, maybe I do things differently, I don't know. But there's one thing I know. I was born a Jew and I'm proud to be a Jew. And when I die, I wanna be buried like Jews have been buried for thousands of years. I want the rabbi to lead the prayers. I want the little bit of earth from the land of Israel. I want the gravestone with those Hebrew letters. I want the, I want the burial society, the Hevra Kadisha, to prepare the body. I want everything. Because in my last statement on planet earth, I want it to say, I may not be a perfect Jew, but I'm a proud one. So I don't know about you, but to me that speaks volumes. Thank you so much for joining together. Uh, rabbis, uh, thank you for hosting me. Um, there's a lot of people, thank God, I'm delighted with the turnout. So I don't know if we can turn off mutes. What do you think, uh, Rabbi Shlomo or Rabbi Ari? I don't know if you can do it through the chats, we'll do questions or uh, do a, the mute. I don't know how you wanna, how you wanna handle it. So first of all, um, Daron, thank you very much. That was clear. You presented things methodically, you presented things in both a, a practical and a, an inspirational way, and we truly appreciate it. 
A big shkayach to Shlomo Weina for putting this all together and for roping the rest of us in to be part of it. We really appreciate it. You may or may not have seen quite a poignant moment in the Surfside recovery efforts earlier this week, uh, last week, where a journalist went over to the head of the Israeli team. You know, they brought out a team of Israelis. And the journalist said, I understand that you have found bodies. And without missing a beat, the head of the Israeli delegation said, um, we have found people, unfortunately, no longer alive. And I think that speaks to the heart of how we see these things. To us, there's no such thing as a body. As you very clearly said, the, the marriage of body and soul doesn't just cease at the moment of death. And so therefore, we see a person as a person, even after they have left this world. So a big, big yashakayach. I see some people have put questions into the chat, right. which we will be happy to address. And then if, if anybody wants to be unmuted, just use that raise your hand icon on the participants button. And that will allow you the opportunity. So raise a virtual hand and then we'll call on you to unmute. So perhaps yeah, so that's- Let me just, let me just answer what's there. But by the way, um, I did mention before that I wanted to give you some resources. So I just typed into the chat uh, a couple of resources. Uh, forgive me, one is my book, Cremation or Burial, a Jewish View, Mosaic of Press. Um, there's two things online, places that I would recommend. Of course, the main source for anything Jewish online is Chabad.org. Um, if you don't visit Chabad.org, you should. Uh, they've got, by the way, on this subject and other subjects, because there's a video of me and articles, not just me. There's a lot of great uh, Chabad rabbis and rabbitsons uh, talking about this subject and every other subject. So if you're interested in more, you can look there. There's also a website that a friend of mine set up based on um, my material and some other people's material called peacefulreturn.org. I, I, I listed it there in the chat. Uh, that's just about burial and cremation. It has top 10 facts. It has some environmental facts. Just if you want, uh, it has a four minute video that we did with actors that's really kind of thought provoking. So if you just want a quick you know, thing to look at, that's a great place to uh, look. Okay, so um, Tanya asked, if a Jewish person is cremated, does that affect their soul? Um, okay, it's, uh, it's a great question and it's a hard question and I'll answer it like this. Um, Pre-COVID, uh, Rabbi Shlomo, you mentioned before that I, uh, I used to be a tour guide in Israel. We don't know when that's going to start again. Hopefully sometime <laughs> soon we'll see when COVID ends. But I also guide groups and families in Eastern Europe, uh, Poland, Lithuania, you know, things like that. And um, I, I'm very big into Holocaust education, and I think it's very important. Obviously, being Jewish is more than the Holocaust. We all know that, but, it, but it's a core part of our identity. And um, people always ask, well, um, you know, if, uh, if cremation is so bad, I mean, what about the 6 million, right? So the answer is like this. Um, someone who is cremated against their will, meaning the Nazis murdered them and then did the final ultimate insult of didn't even allow them to have proper burial, which they would have given an arm and a leg for, so to speak, um, then God will take care of that. God is good. But for someone to choose to be cremated, uh, that's a different matter. Our tradition says, and this is another, um, Debbie, you mentioned in the chat, uh, resurrection. So it's funny, the rabbis are probably in shock that I didn't mention the number one reason that the Talmud mentions for burial. We invite this guy from Israel to speak about burial and cremation, and he didn't mention the number one reason that the Talmud gives. I, I knew about it, it was on purpose, trust me, I know, I know, a little bit annoying. Why didn't I? Well, because it sounds a little freaky. Um, I don't know uh, if uh, I don't know if you remember or if you had the same uh, you know experience that I did, but uh, when I think of the dead coming back to life, you know what I I'm not proud of this, but we're all friends now, all 150 of us, so I, so I'll share with you. Um, do you know what I think of intuitively? Michael Jackson's Thriller, zombies coming out of the ground, Thriller, you know, like you know the zombie movies. I mean, we believe in this stuff. It seems like a bunch of crazy, I mean, what? And the truth is, there's a lot of beautiful Jewish ideas that because we're introduced to them through the lens of Hollywood or Christianity or whatever, like they lose their form, like they don't, they don't seem normal, right? So truth is, um, Voltaire once said, it's no more of a miracle to be born twice than born once. Kind of an interesting quote, right? Talmud says it's a little bone. Some say it's over here. Some say it's at the bottom, called the loose bone that never disintegrates. And from there, the dead will come back. So uh, 
two things. One is a physical, how did that happen? And two, why, right? So um, remember the whole thing I talked about with um, the difference between like, let's say us and, and Catholicism in terms of celibacy, right? That it's not just a random thing, the Catholics, you know, the, the, the Catholic priests and nuns are celibates. It's not, it's part of a philosophy. It's a, you know, temptation, sin is bad. The world is bad, right? Physicality is bad. And if you want to be spiritual, you have to avoid it. We say the opposite. We say we're here to uplift physicality. God created the world to use, right? You have to be the rider on the horse, not the, not the horse on the rider. But, but it, 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 so long body are partners. The body is good, right? So not a surprise that um, if the body is bad, you're just going to, uh, you know, burn it. <laughs> Big deal. And if the body is good, you're going to treat it, you know, respectfully. And not a surprise that if the body is good, it has a role to play in the future. I could not give charity without my body. Stop that. I could not have children. I could not hug a, a, a sad person. I could not bring a sick person, a, you know, chicken soup. You know, the soul and the body are partners. And the body is rewarded and the body has a role to play in the future as well because physicality is good. Now, how that works, I don't know. But I'll tell you how it works scientifically, okay? Does anybody remember that little sheep called Dolly that was cloned? It's over 30 years ago. Cloning today, way more advanced. The idea that, you know, from the Jurassic Park movies with the dinosaurs, they get a little DNA and they grow a dinosaur, that's more science than science fiction. Right? It's just a matter of time of getting it right technically. For those of you who've been to Israel, you probably visited Masada, the great you know, windswept desert fortress on the Dead Sea. Yigal Yedin, the archeologist, was Ramakal, he was a minister. So he, um, when he dug there in the 1950s, they found 2000 year old date pits from palm trees. They extracted the DNA and we have dates, we have date trees growing up in the botanical gardens down the road. It's not a miracle. It's science to be able to take DNA. What the loose bone is, I think it's probably just a little bit of DNA and, in, and you know, an infinitely small little bit of physicality that's left and the dead are going to come back. And yes, we're not supposed to work against it. We're supposed to vote for it. So that's why the tradition says that we should not cremate. Okay, a few other, um, Yes, uh, you know, um, somebody texted me that nothing was mentioned about T.S. Mason was on purpose. I wanted to leave it till now uh, that, that to understand the place of, of uh, the physical and the spiritual. Okay, so uh, someone said, often people don't feel that there were sufficiently Jewish religion enough to be buried, so they go the so-called easy way and the family cremates their family. How does one convince them otherwise? Okay, so the first thing is, um, People do things for reasons. I believe, and this is a, you know, I, I fancy myself an educator. And again, the burial cremation thing is a relatively new thing in, in my, uh, my areas of, of knowledge and specialization. I was always uh, focused on, on different areas, uh, raising families to be Jewish and keeping families Jewish and Jewish spirituality and, and relationships. So this is what I'm gonna share is a, um, is a principle in education in general, I believe. People aren't stupid. People do things for reasons. Give them respect. Most people today who choose cremation, it's not because they're bad. It's not because they just, no one's ever presented them with a coherent explanation of why we bury, right? Um, once you do, I find this is an easy one to talk about, right? It's not like this is, you know, when someone is deciding are they going to keep kosher or not? Now, keeping kosher today is not that hard. I mean, you know, you can get kosher food anywhere, but um, but still, it's, well, it's effect, that affects my kitchen, right? That, that, that's personal. That's a big deal. What's, what's the big deal? It's a few extra thousand dollars. It's not. The, what's the big deal? You know, it's a, it's a it's a Starbucks coffee every once in a while. It's not. You know, it's not. Take care of it early. I'm very into pre-planning, meaning that um, religion, religious milestones, life milestones, are supposed to bring a family together. And too often they tear families apart. One kid wants to do this, one kid wants to do that, one kid's being cheap, one kid's they don't leave it to the kids. You arrange. This is what I want, whether the kids like it or not. You know, I'm leaving you plenty of money. The extra few thousand dollars, it's not yours anyway. <laughs> I work for it. And my last statement on the planet, I want to be properly buried. That way, 
when God forbid the time comes, there's no tension, there's no fighting, there's no questions, there's no back and forth. It's all clear and they can focus on what they're supposed to focus on, a family coming together in a time of grief. I have never seen burial rip a family apart. People know that Jews bury. Cremation, boy, have I seen it rip families apart. One person becomes more observant. One person gets into Jewish family tree, genealogy, and it just tears them apart that they don't have a place to go. You have it, you know, in your wallet. You know, God forbid when it happens, here's the name of the Chabad rabbi. Here's his phone number. Here's his, his, his text message, his Instagram. You know, everything goes through him. <laughs> Taken care of. Okay, so when you talk to people, so that's, uh, you know, Avron, you were asking how you, uh, you, you tell people, send them to those websites that I mentioned, either find something on Chabad or they like, a peaceful return, use this talk as an excuse, get them a copy of my book. People, people are willing to talk about this. You, you know, say, I just heard this guy from Israel gave this talk, what do you think about it? You know, okay, next. Um, so um, someone on iPhone is saying that um, there's a phobia of being, uh, being claustrophobic. Okay, I've heard this a lot, actually. So think of it this way. Um, how spacey do you think a crematorium oven is? <laughs> Forgive my like, you know, being jovial about it, okay? Um, have you ever seen them? I mean, they're exactly like they were in the Holocaust. I guide people in the camps, I visited them. Um, one, the body is being burned. You know, the other, it's being buried. Um, so they're both kind of unpleasant. Um, either you believe the, the, the you're aware or you're not aware, right? So uh, if you're aware, both are pretty unpleasant. If you're not aware, it doesn't matter. So um, I wouldn't worry about it. You know, I, I don't know if that fully answers your question. You're welcome to uh, go back on the chat now and follow up if that didn't. But it, both are kind of unpleasant, aren't they? You know, why is one better than the other? Okay, next. Um, so, um, yeah. Um, hands up. So, oh, Rabbi Shishli, so there's somebody, uh, somebody who had a question you wanted to address. Um, okay, uh, Gary Ron, said that. Ron, oh, had a okay. Well, I'm just. Gonna, should I keep going on the chats, or you have somebody that wants to ask? Uh, he's unmuted. He's ready to ask. Oh, okay. Go for it. Please ask. Uh, Rabbi, good, uh, good evening. Um, I put my my question in the chat, but however, when Mashiach arrives, and we all believe that he will hopefully soon, how will those who are cremated be able to be resurrected if they, if they are just nothing, if they've been strewn into, into the ocean or whatever it may be? But it's only those who are buried properly that will be able to, to come up and, and go to our rightful place. Well, let me ask you a question, Ronnie, because you phrased it so well. What about the six million? The six million, as you said, were cremated against their will. Hashem understands that and Hashem has got a special place for them. Okay, agreed. So let's say you have a person that is born Jewish on a Pacific island, um, but never knew he was Jewish, never met a Jew, never heard of Jews, right? And he was cremated uh, because that's what people on that island did. What's going to happen to him? Rabbi, that he, he didn't live a Jewish life. He doesn't know that he was Jewish, but Hashem okay. Knows, okay. He, knows that he was Jewish. Okay. And so Hashem I'm understands his predicament, and therefore he's got special dispensation. So I am, I am with you 100%. I've asked this question. By the way, the first part of the Holocaust victims is brought down in our sources very clearly, right? My Pacific Island example is not, but I've asked some of the greatest rabbis on the planet, and they agree with you. <laughs> so, so, so I put you in good stead up there, Ronnie. That's good. Um, but um, the point I think is that uh, we have to, um, we can't faint ignorance and just, you know, like we have to do our best. That's all God asks of us. Um, and that's all that we ask of ourselves. Uh, so that's why I'm trying to spread this, this knowledge. I encourage you to make it clear to your family members, talk to your friends, uh, this is a subject that can be talked about. It's not so personal that people are so, you know, you can talk about it, you can convince people, you can explain. People think it's in the environment. It's not the environment. Uh, by the way, no Jewish community that I know of has ever cremated, let somebody be cremated because of money. Even if you have somebody who's indigent, somebody who doesn't have money, the Jewish community comes together and, and makes it happen. I'm sure that's true in South Africa as well. So, um, so there's, no, there's no issue. We just have to spread, spread knowledge. 
Um, okay, thank you, and I appreciate it. A few more questions that I see in the chat. Um, the bones being crushed. Yes, it's a fascinating thing. Have you ever been, I don't know if any of you here has ever been to, I'm sure you probably have, ancient Roman or Greek archaeological sites, and they have um, these ostruaries, they have these like burial, uh, like uh, these boxes where the cremated remains, you know, were, and they're all about this size, right? And today, an urn of a, of a cremated person is about this size. And I was like curious, I don't know what, like today they do it like this. So why 2000 years ago were they all like this? And I looked into it, it's actually very simple because um, when a body is cremated, there's no ashes. It's just dried out bone. And the biggest bone to survive is the femur, right? That's the longest bone in the human body. So the boxes that the Romans and the Greeks used were the femur like on an angle. That's how big the box was. Today, what they do after, when, when, when the oven turns off, right? And they take the shovel and they, you know, bring out whatever they can bring out. And by the way, very often the remains get mixed because they can't get everything off the walls. So one person with another person, another person, whatever. So uh, you can Google it and find out more if you really are masochistic. Um, so uh, they, they then crush the bones. They used to call it grinding grandma, forgive me. It used to be by hand. Now the machine that does it. And that's how you get the fine, um, the fine uh, powder, right? It's, 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 it's crushed. Interestingly, by the way, uh, I looked into this, there's a forensics expert in Australia that got me onto this trail, that um, forensics experts don't like cremation because there's no DNA left. Isn't that fascinating? There's no scientific way to distinguish between the cremated, cremated remains of John, Paul, Harry, or anybody else. The DNA is burnt out. Take a seed, put it in the ground. What happens? Beautiful plant grows. Take a seed, burn it, and then put it in the ground. What happens? Nothing. There's no growth. It's a destruction. Fire destroys. Okay, next. Um, yeah, is the deceased aware of what's going on? So um, our sources do talk about it. I think the uh, rabbis uh, over here may be very, very qualified more than me. To, uh, to discuss, I will share one simple answer, which is yes. Um, the world, this world is connected with the next world. The soul is aware uh, that that's why I mentioned that during Shiva, it's going back and forth to, to hear what's being said about it. And, and as far as we understand, it is, uh, it is aware that the do know what's happening. Um, I, I see a, a, um, a hand up from Mayor. Um, can we? Uh... That's me. Oh. Can, can, can you hear me, Rabbi? Yes, we can. Okay, so I thought I would share this with you. Um, I married into the German Jewish, um, a German Jewish family. And oh, you poor, you poor guy. No, I'm just kidding. I, I did too. <laughs> Listen, you have my sympathy as well. <laughs> <laughs> and what I wanted to tell you that um, it was common to the people who were born at the early 20th century uh, amongst the German Jewish community, certainly the, the non from community, the secular community, that they would be uh, cremated. <clears throat> what, what, what happened was after my father passed away, um, I read Rabbi Lamb's book, which will give me that um, that, that, that I recommend maybe he, his opposition to you, but it, it, it was a, a very fascinating book. And my understanding was that if you are cremated, the soul will die with you. And that's the way I, I understood it. So I approached my father-in-law and I said, what did you put in your will? And he said, no, I reckon I, I, I want to, I'm doing what, what my parents did and what my siblings are doing. I'm going to be cremated. And I said to him, you know, from what I've read, um, I, I don't think you should be cremated. And we, we had a very good relationship. And I said to him, please, I, I've asked you for nothing other than your daughter's hand in my life. I don't want you to be cremated. I want you to live on. And he said, yeah, sure. He said, I don't mind. So Thank I said, you. Will, you, will you write it down? And he never wrote it down. 
No. Now he passed on. And uh, it was time to make the decision. In his will, it says he's going to be cremated. So I said at the time, listen, he gave me his word that he didn't want to be cremated. He changed his mind. He just didn't. He just didn't change the will. He didn't think it was, I, I don't know, for whatever reason. Anyway, they approached the, the, his, his Aaron, children. I'm just going to ask you just to, just to shorten because we have other people waiting to speak. So just okay. To... okay, well, th th this is the conclusion. Nobody objected to him being buried, and thank God he was buried and he was not cremated. I just thank you. So, uh, for you raised, first of all, thank you for sharing. You've raised a couple of very important things. Um, number one is that um, you can ask people to change on this, even for you or for the logical reasons. And very often it works. It's that simple. And number two, and I really am glad you mentioned it, to get it in writing. Absolutely. Uh, it's one of these things that it's just who knows what's going to happen, you know, in the future and, and get it in writing. And I think that's a really, really good point. So I, I really appreciate you, um, you uh, pointing that out. Um, okay. Um, Avron, I don't know how you pronounce your first name. I'm sorry. Do you want to uh, share? I see your hand is up. Rabbi Shishla, what do we do over here? I have asked him to unmute. Okay, he might not be there as well. Okay, um, so are we there? No, okay. Um, okay, let me share um, just uh, another, um, another idea uh, as, we, uh, as we wind down uh, and we get to our, um, you know, we, uh, we get to our, our, our goodbye. Um, anybody know what happens to a, uh, a Torah scroll? that is damaged beyond repair. What do you do to the Torah scroll? We bury it, right? We've all heard of this. Cemeteries have a place for, you know, for burial of Torah scrolls. So let me ask you a question. God forbid, rabbis don't get nervous. It's only a hypothetical question to make a point. God forbid there is a fire in the shul, fire in the synagogue, and you can go and try and save the Torah scrolls, the safer Torahs. Raise your hand if you'd be a hero and save the Torah. Hmm? Right. Well, it all depends, right? Because if the firemen say, yeah, no problem. Like we've already contained the fire, just a little bit of smoke. Uh, you can go and get your, your Torah. Of course, go and save the Torah from the smoke damage. Do, go. go. But what if the firemen say to you, sir, you can't go in there. It's dangerous. You might not come back. Are you allowed? Jewish law. Are you allowed to try and save the Torah? And the answer is no. Because although a Torah scroll is the holiest object we have, you are holier. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, or you're old or you're young, or you're sick or you're healthy, or you're learned or not. It doesn't matter. You are holier than a Torah scroll and you're not even allowed to risk your life to save it. We bury a Torah scroll because it's holy. We bury a human being because we are even holier. We bury treasure. We bury things we love. And that's the thing, the idea that I wanted to leave with you. There's lots of practical reasons. The practical reason, right? That isn't what the cremation societies claim about the environment is not true and mobility, all the stuff we went through. But ultimately, the reason to bury is I'm a Jew. And my final decision, my final statement on the planet, here lies a proud Jew. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it has been a distinct pleasure. Rabbis, thank you for hosting and for initiating this. Um, and uh, we should all have busuros toy voice. We should all have good news, only good news coming from everywhere. Amen, amen. Again, thank you, thank you very much. Incredible presentation, and I think it should be mandatory for for every community to to hear this. I really do. So big yashakayach to you again. A big thank you to Shlomo for putting it together. Thank you for all of you for joining us this evening. Please, God, we should have many opportunities to join together and to speak about, as Doron said right in the beginning, topics of Lechayim. Thanks very much, everybody.